Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to our midweek online Bible study. Uh, it's been two Sundays and one Wednesday that we have not studied together. I thank God for a short break from the preaching and teaching responsibilities to rest my body uh, and to refocus my mind and my heart. And we also thank God for the speakers who God used uh, while I was away. Uh, we thank for we thank uh, Pastor Reniel, uh and Pastor Matt uh, Matthew for uh, 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 bringing to us the Word of God for these past two Sundays. So now we're back. Uh, so as we study God's Word tonight, shall we turn our Bibles to First Peter chapter two? We'll start a new chapter uh, with this study, and we will look at verses one to three. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. I will read it from here. You can uh, read it with me or follow it with your eyes. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Growing up as an adult, more or less, we have realized the importance of maturity. I know you would agree with me that immaturity has been the major cause of problems at any relationship level, whether it's with our family, whether it's with our friendships, whether it's with our workplace, or even in our church. I am sure that you, if you look closely, uh, you can trace the root of the problem or the problems at the immaturity of a certain family member. Maybe you have that one brother or that one sister uh, at home that really is immature. That's why he or she is causing the problem. Or you may have a co-worker, a fellow believer, or even a pastor who is immature. Or maybe the immaturity is not with others, but also within ourselves that is causing the problem. Thus, the lack of maturity can really cause frictions, disunity, uh, that we find it hard to live in harmony with each other. So as God has constituted a new people, as this is the theme, God's new people, starting from chapter 1 verse 22 to chapter 2 verse 10, in His church, as He has granted them new life, for them to live together in harmony and in unity, they need to grow spiritually. I know this growth is not only for the sake of unity, but because true life will also inevitably grow. But the question is, how can this growth happen? So for this study, we ask, as God's new people, why should we grow into spiritual maturity? And how can we grow into spiritual maturity? As God's new people, why should we grow into spiritual maturity? And how can we grow? As you have professed to be a believer, have you really grown to be spiritually mature? Maybe you're 10 years or 15 years or 20 years that you have be, uh, professed to be a believer of Christ. Have you really grown that you can say, I have grown in the Lord? Or can you say, now I'm more mature than, than before or than 10 years from, uh, than 10 years ago or 15 years ago? Now, one of the realities I have to face as a pastor is for me to realize uh, the truth that maturity does not come with age. Because I would come across old people in the church that are very immature. So with our study tonight, I do hope we would take a real honest look into our own spiritual life and assess whether we have really grown in the Lord. So that if we have not, we will be honest with ourselves then we can know why should we grow and how we can grow in Him. Now, the main point here of verses 1 to 3 is found in verse 2. Look at your Bibles. Long for the pure spiritual milk like newborn infants. Now, if you notice, Peter is fond of uh, figurative language of comparing things. So here he is comparing us like newborn infants, but the directive here is that we should long for the pure spiritual milk. Now, it may not be obvious in the ESV, 
because there seems to be two action verbs that Peter used here to call believers in this book to do or in this portion to do. These are the words of the verbs put away in verse 1 and long for in verse 2. But both the King James Version and the NASB seem to render verses 1 to 3 as one sentence. Uh, they put it in a comma and there's no capitalized version in the King James and the ESV that it seems that verse 1 to 3 is one sentence. So to simplify, Peter is telling Christians simply in verse 1 to 3 to long for the spiritual milk. But the question is, why should they long for the spiritual milk? For what purpose should they long for the spiritual milk? Why should believers long for the spiritual milk and for what purpose that they should long for it? Let's start first with the question, why? I believe the first reason why we should grow in our spiritual life or long for the spiritual milk for growing in our spiritual life is found in the first word of verse 1. The word is so. The word rendered so here is an inference, a conclusion in reference to something he has discussed previously. In the King James, it is rendered wherefore. In the NASB, rendered therefore, it can mean these things being so. It brings us back to what he previously talked about in chapter 1. Thus, talking about uh, growth in verse 2 here in chapter 2 through the Word of God, I believe this conclusion or inference in verse 1 of chapter 2 is referring to the new life received from the Word of God in verses 23 to 25. As believers has been born again by the living and abiding Word of God, this is why believers should long for the word or should be growing by the word of God. Because we have been born again through the word of God called by Peter as imperishable in chapter 1 verses 23 to 25 as living and abiding word. So since we have received new spiritual life through the imperishable seed and the living and abiding word of God, we have to long for that same word for what purpose? So that we can grow in the spiritual life given to us. Long for the milk like infants. In comparing believers to newborn infants, Peter is not saying that we ought to be immature in our faith. But that all Christians are to be like infants in longing for spirit, pure spiritual milk. The pure spiritual milk here refers to God's word that we should long after, that we should desire to be nourished or to be fed by. Now, this rendering of the ESV gives us the word spiritual milk. But in the Greek, it is the word logikos, which echoes the word logos or the word of chapter 1, verse 23, the word of God. Long for the pure word that will be your milk. Thus, the King James Version in the NASB rendered it more plainly by saying, Long for the pure milk of the Word of God. However, in, this, in a sense, the ESV, by calling it spiritual milk, is telling us that as milk is our physical nourishment to grow physically when we were babies, let us have the same thirst and longing for our spiritual nourishment by the Word of God to make us grow in our spiritual life. As babies would cry out for milk when they are hungry so that they can be fed and they can grow. That was naturally um, designed by God for babies to long for food. In the same way, Peter is using that figure as we have received new spiritual life through the living Word. Let us also long to be nourished by uh, in our spiritual life by that same living word. For what purpose? The purpose of longing for spiritual nourishment is spiritual growth. We ought to grow in the spiritual life given to us by God. Life will never be static. It cannot remain the same because we will change. No one can prevent physical growth spurt unless there's an abnormality to our physical bodies. 
unless you have dwarfism, you will not grow. Unless there's some abnormalities with your genes, you will not grow. But no one can prevent growth. In the same way, if we truly have spiritual lives in God through His life-giving Word, we will long to grow by that same Word. That's why spiritual growth is always marked by a craving for and a delight in God's Word with the intensity with which a baby craves milk. That's why we have a couple of verses here that I want to raise. Job 23 verse 12, he says, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my portion of food. Now, by biblical tradition, Job lived in the time of the patriarchs. He lived in the same time as um, Abraham. And the book written about his life is uh, said by tradition to be one of the earliest books written. So there was almost none recorded books about God's Word. But to hear something from God, for Job, it was something that he treasured. And he says it is a fulfilling, and it is fulfilling his desire more than his food, more than the portion of my food. I have treasured the words of his mouth. This similar truth of such desire for God's word is also found in the book of Psalms. When they uh, wrote the book of Psalms, when they composed these songs about God's word, uh, they, have not, they do not have the completed uh, version of the, of, the com of the total Bible yet. They have partial, a partial Old Testament or they may have a complete Old Testament by that time. But for them to say, like in Psalm 19, verse 10, More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb, more desirable than gold and sweeter than honey. Psalm 119, uh, 19, verse 48, I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love. I will meditate on your statutes. He loves the commandments of God and he will meditate on his word. Psalm 119, verse 103, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And Jeremiah would say in chapter 15, verse 16, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Yahweh, or Lord, God of hosts. So, Spiritual growth is always marked by a craving for and a delight in God's Word with the intensity with which a baby craves for the milk. So our first lesson for uh, tonight in chapter uh, 2, verse 2 is this. As we have been born again by the living and eternal Word of God, let us desire to be nourished by that same Word so that we can grow in our spiritual life. As we have been born again by the living and eternal Word of God, let us desire to be nourished by that same Word so that we can grow in our spiritual life. With the verses that I shared to you a while ago, my question to you is this. Do you have this intense desire, a longing for spiritual nourishment so that you can grow in your spiritual life? Do you long for God's Word? Do you desire His Word, to love His Word, meditate upon it? Because there is no other way by which we can grow apart from the Word of God. This is why preaching of God's Word is still central, important to what we do here in church. Christian education is still important to our church. Biblical literacy is still my aim for each of you so that... You would grow in your knowledge of the Bible, in your passion to seek for it, study it, and live it out. Because it is not by Christian miracles or of healing or speaking in tongues that you will grow in your Christian life. It is not by Christian experience, apart from God's Word, being a reality in your life, that you will grow. You cannot divorce Christian experience with the Word because apart from the Word, that experience is not guided and firmly rooted in the truth. So our spiritual nourishment is found in the pure spiritual milk of the living and abiding Word of God. Pure. That's, that Word is unadulterated. 
It's not mixed with anything else. There is no other means by which we can grow in our spiritual life apart from God's word. That is why Jesus would say, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. It is God who will sustain us, direct us, and guide us in what we do through his very word. Thus, the incarnate word, Jesus Christ, is also called the bread of life because it is him who will sustain us, nourish us, and feed us through his very word. That's why as we have been born again by the living and eternal word of God, let us desire to be nourished by that same word so that we can grow in our spiritual life. Do you desire to be nourished by his word? Secondly, uh, the emphasis for this longing of the word uh, of God to grow is further emphasized by verse 3. Look at verse 3. He says here, If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. The word, the phrase, if indeed, is a conditional statement that can be rendered seeing that. Seeing that you have tasted that the Lord is good. This tasting is related to the longing. But the difference is, uh, the word tasted here is said in the past tense. So this taste must have happened in conversion. So Christians will continue to long for the word if they have tasted that the Lord is good when they did in their conversion. If you have tasted that the Lord is good, uh, they would say that this must likely have come from a reference in Psalm 34 verse 8. When, when the psalmist said, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now in writing this letter, Peter likely, uh, scholars would say that Peter likely meditated at length upon Psalm 34, which Psalm 34 tells us about how the Lord delivers the righteous in their sufferings. So there is a parallel between Psalm 34 and what Peter wrote in 1 Peter. That's why he takes this one portion of Psalm 34. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Christians have tasted the goodness of the Lord at their conversion. So at salvation, all believers experience how gracious the Lord is to those who trust him. That tasting of God's goodness should compel believers to seek more of that grace in pursuing his word. So this is the second reason why we should long for the spiritual nourishment of the Word of God to grow in our spiritual life. We long for His Word. Why? Verse 3 tells us, because we have tasted His goodness when we heard and believed His life-giving Word when we were saved. No Christian who truly tasted the goodness of the Lord will find a hard reason to long further for His words to nourish his own soul. If you don't have this longing for God's word, maybe it's because you have not tasted the true goodness of the Lord yet. You have a distaste for the things of God because your religion made you. You were exposed to the wrongs and evils of an impure, hypocritical, judgmental type of religion. That when you come into that church, oh, this church is so judgmental, so hypocrite, so impure, that when the pastor preaches, you don't uh, pay attention to him. Or in your own home, you don't have the time to, to spend in the Word of God. Or if it's not a judgmental, hypocritical type of religion, you were exposed to a licentious, abusive, sinful malpractice, tolerance of a religion with no holiness. So it's either too strict or too loose. That's why you lost your taste or you have a distaste for the things of God. But Peter is telling us another reason why we should long to grow in his word. And the reason is, and it's our second lesson here in verse 3, those who truly tasted the goodness of God in salvation will continue to long to grow in that salvation. Those who truly tasted the goodness of God in salvation will continue to long to grow in that salvation. At the Bible school, I remember in one of our subjects, uh, the subject is teaching the Bible, I learned a principle about being a good Bible teacher. 
I learned that it is our task as teachers to create an appetite with our students for them to want the Word of God. So the lesson uh, uh, taught us that we have to make our lesson interesting, not lifeless and boring. So that even you tell the story of Goliath for the 20th time, you have to tell it like it's fresh, like it's new. So while that is true in a sense, naturally, an unconverted sinner would have no natural appetite for the Word of God. Yes, as Bible teachers, we should make our lessons interesting and full of life, not boring. But naturally, a sinner who is unconverted, unsaved, would have no natural desire for God's Word. They would not listen to Him, seek Him, respond to Him, much less obey His Word. So while it is my task as a Bible teacher not to bore you or turn you away by an ineffective teaching, by a boring kind of teaching, Peter is telling us that our longing to grow in the Word is based on the fact that we have already tasted His goodness when we were saved. We then should feed that appetite by keep coming back for more. As we have tasted God's goodness when we were saved, we have to continue to seek We have to feed that appetite by keep coming back for more to be nourished by His Word. Think of eating. Who does not think about eating? Many of us think about what to eat for lunch while we have our breakfast. But now I want you to think further. Think of your favorite food. This is the second reason of Peter here in verse 3. This reason is beyond nourishment. But this reason is an enjoyment of a true spiritual experience we had at our conversion. It started at our conversion. We tasted the Lord in our conversion. And we continue to long to feed on that appetite by nourishing ourselves with the Word of God. It's beyond nourishment. It is enjoyment. So to those who truly tasted the goodness of God, um, of God's saving grace by His Word, They will continue to desire to be nourished um, by that same life-nourishing word. No wonder I would hear of people telling me that when they were saved, they can never stop enjoying. They would tell me, Pastor, when, when God opened my eyes when I was saved, I enjoy listening to preaching. I enjoy opening up my Bible and reading it. I cannot stop reading it. I want to know more of God and of His Word to nourish my soul. Because when you have tasted the best food in the world's best restaurant, cooked by the world's best chef, you will keep coming back for more. So in the same way, why would you not see the value of the pure spiritual nourishment? Why would you not see the value of God's uh, word that you would enjoy its taste that started when you were saved. Kung sa ilong gupa, gapanamit ko sa pulong sang ginoo, you enjoy to feed on the word of God. So our lesson here in verse 3 is that those who truly tasted the goodness of God in salvation will continue to long to grow in that salvation. God's word has life gives life and nourishes life. So as we have tasted the goodness of God in salvation, let us continue to long to grow in that salvation by nourishing ourselves with His Word. Finally, we ask the question, how? How can we grow spiritually in the Word? We circle back to verse 1. Look at verse 1. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Sometimes children have no appetite because they have been eating the wrong things. When we were kids, we were told not to eat much junk food because it is not food. And especially before meals. Uh, My parents would say do not eat much junk food before dinner so because you would lose your appetite. Because wrong food or wrong things can take our appetite away. So Peter warns, warned his readers to put aside or to put away certain wrong attitudes of the heart 
that would hinder their appetite and spiritual growth. Now, while this seems to be in the verb form in the ESV, put away, but both the King James Version and the NASB rendered it in a pre prepositional phrase, adding ing to describe the manner in which we can also long for the Word of God. That is, we should be putting away, laying aside, or putting aside certain wrong attitudes and actions that would hinder our appetite for the Word and our spiritual growth. What are this, these sins? The first sin here is in verse, two, uh, verse 1, put away all malice. Now, malice means wickedness in general. Our Filipino understanding of the word malice or malicia or malicioso for the person is kind of wrong because we have limited malicia or malice to an evil intention, my malicia, or with a more motive base or, a sec or has a sexual connotation to it. But the Greek word here is used for evil or wickedness in general. It is used 11 times in the New Testament to indicate that wickedness that comes from within a person. All sorts of wickedness. Malice is evil in general. Deceit here is craftiness. Using devious words and action to get what we want. Of course, if we are guilty of malice and deceit, we will try to hide it. No one wants to be obvious when they have evil motives, intentions, or plans. That's why they would deceive others. And this would produce, verse 1 here, hypocrisy. Often the cause of ill will is envy. We have evil intention. We have malice against others because we have envy within our hearts. And one, of, one result of envy is the last sin here in verse 1, slander or evil speaking or conversation that tears the other person down. So if these attitudes and actions are in our lives, we will lose our appetite for the pure word of God. If we stop feeding on the word, we stop growing, we stop enjoying the grace that we find in the Lord. That's why Hebrews 12.1 calls every believer to run the race of faith to the finish line with endurance. But to be able to do that, they have to lay aside every weight or every hindrance, especially the sin which clings tightly to us, hindering us, clobbering us, bothering us, impeding our progress. So my question to you this evening is this, what sin is bothering you right now? What sins are hindering your spiritual growth? Is it the evil within your heart? Is it deceit that you're trying to hide your sin? Is it hypocrisy? Is it envy? Is it slander or what other sin is bothering your spiritual growth? What sins are in the way of you longing and seeking for the Word of God? That's why Peter tells us to put away. This injunction tells us that believers are still capable of doing these things to one another. It's not unbelievers that he's talking to here. He's telling believers, you have to put this away because the Christian's new life cannot grow unless sins are actively dealt with, renounced, put away. That's why our last lesson here in verse 1 is this. To long for spiritual nourishment to grow, we have to rid ourselves of the sinful hindrances. To long for spiritual nourishment to grow, we have to rid ourselves of the sinful hindrances. That's why I remember a quote uh, for which I forgot the author. He said this, The Bible will keep you from sin, but sin will also keep you from your Bible. The Bible will keep you from sin, but sin will also keep you from the Bible. Choose the one over the other. That's why Psalm 119 verse 11 tells us, I have stored up your word or I have hid your word in my heart 
that I might not sin against you. It is when we treasure God's word in our lives, when we seek for it, it will keep us from sin rather than sin keeping us from our Bibles. So has sin or sins kept you from seeking to nourish yourself with the word of God these days? I would challenge you, I would ask you to put away those sins, surrender them to God so that you can get back in the right track with your relationship to God. To long for spiritual nourishment to grow, we have to rid ourselves of the sinful hindrances. So for our study tonight, we go back to our question uh, for verses 1 to 3. As God's new people, why and how can we grow into spiritual maturity? Why should we grow into spiritual maturity? And how can we grow into spiritual maturity? Our application for verses 1 to 3 for this evening is this. As people born again by God's uh, life-giving word, we should long for the spiritual nourishment through his word, renounce sinful hindrances so that we can mature spiritually. As people born again by God's life-giving word, we should long for the spiritual nourishment through his word, renounce sinful hindrances so that we can mature spiritually. When Christians are growing in the word, they become peacemakers, not troublemakers. And in the process, they promote the unity of the church. Mature Christians will learn to love each other earnestly and genuinely with the love of God. We can learn to contribute to the solution of the problems than being the cause of it. Then we will be assured and enjoy the reality of the new life given to us in salvation because we see that we have really grown in our life in the Lord. So don't be immature. Don't be lifeless in your spiritual life. Make it right with the Lord. Now, when I was a kid, there is a Sunday school song we learned early on. The song is, read your Bible and pray every day. So you grow, grow, grow. Now, it was an action song. And when we were singing it as a child, all I care about when I was singing it is that uh, I can jump higher than my Sunday school friends. Because um, this song uh, has an action to it. We would jump, we would uh, stand on a chair so that we would grow higher than any of our friends. But this song never became a reality until I went to the seminary. Read your Bible and pray every day so you grow. Um, I never read my Bible on my own. I never prayed on my own with my own will as a child. This song became a reality only when I went to the seminary. It is then and there when I truly received spiritual life from God and I began to see the true value of His life-giving, spiritual nourishing word. When I can say to myself, I have been born again, I have received that true spiritual life, I began to truly seek His Word to feed my soul, to nourish my soul so that I can grow in Him. I begin to grow my love for His Word. I begin to see the value in His Word. Now, until now, I am still growing. And we will never stop growing until we reach glory and perfection in the very presence of God. But the temptation of reading the Bible just for the sake of reading is still there. There are days that I would read just for the sake that I have something to preach. The temptation to not read the Bible is also there, even though I am a pastor. I could go on for days or even weeks without reading it. So I would revise the lyrics of this children's song. I would say, feed yourself with the Bible and pray every day so you grow and mature. Feed yourself with the Bible and pray every day so you would grow and mature. Don't just read it. Feed yourself with it. So my question to you this evening is this. How have you fed yourself with the Word of God during the stay-home period? Have you really made good use of this time to spend more time in the Word of God? 
What more excuse do you have? Because prior to this, you would say, Pastor, I have no time. Yes, you will have no time if you don't make time for it. Now that you are on, you're only at home, you have less thing, things to do, you have less things bothering you, what more excuse do you have for not feeding yourself with God's Word, for not spending more time to enjoy, to be nourished by God's Word? Are you as excited to binge watch your Netflix series or K-drama series as you would seek nourishment in the Word of God? If you don't have this longing or desire in your heart to be nourished by God's Word, maybe it is because you don't have a spiritual life within you yet. Make that right with Him first. Maybe you don't see the value of His Word. Maybe you don't treasure His Word. Maybe you don't long for His Word like a baby because you don't have life in the first place. Make that right with Him first. I found that life in the seminary, in my dorm room, two days after my 18th birthday, January 12th. It's not too late to make it right with God now. But brethren in the Lord, feed yourself with the Bible and pray every day so you would grow and mature. So as God's born again people by His life-giving word, we should long for the spiritual nourishment through His Word, renounce the sinful hindrances so that we can mature spiritually. We are still work um, in progress, but may we continue to progress. Whether it's fast or slow, big steps or small steps, let us continue to grow by longing, desiring, feeding ourselves with His life-giving Word and with His life-nourishing Word. Let us enjoy our time in God's Word. Shall we pray? Father, we thank You for Your Word, the living and abiding Word that has granted us new life, spiritual life, eternal life in You. But by the same Word, You will nourish us they, by the same word, you would allow us to grow. So I pray that we will have this longing in our hearts to feed ourselves with your word so that we can grow. Father, I pray that the sinful hindrances within our hearts, within our lives, Lord, we would surrender them to you. We can give them to you. Put it all away. Renounce it actively, daily, so that nothing will hinder us from seeking you in your word. And I pray, Father, for each one of us that we will continue to grow, to progress in our spiritual life, to be more mature day in and day out. Father, for us to grow in you and enjoy our life in you. I pray for those who don't have this life yet, that they will make it right with you, that they will receive life from your life-giving word, so that they will also grow in your word. We thank you for your truth this evening have challenged our hearts. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. This is God's word for tonight. Uh, thank you for spending time together with us. After this, we'll continue to have our D groups. We'll continue to share the blessings that we have received from God's word. Uh, thank you so much for studying with us tonight. We hope to see you again next Wednesday night, Lord willing. Have a good night.